I thank the organizers for inviting me for giving this important talk on uh, immediate and long-term issues in posterior urethral valve. I will uh, start by illustrating some case scenarios. We all know that uh, how a normal urethra looks and how a classical posterior urethral valve looks. And then there are some cases where there is a suspicious or doubtful posterior urethral valve. I'm actually not even going to this particular entity. I'm going to talk about only classical posterior urethral valve. What are the challenges? The immediate issues are the antenatal diagnosis, severity assessment, the role of termination, role of intervention, dealing with the neonatal issues, diversion versus fulgration, early CKD, how do you manage it? Then the long-term issues like wetting, urinary tract infections, renal impairment, growth, bladder dysfunction, chronic kidney disease, and end-stage renal disease. How we encounter all these things when we see the cases. So I'll just show um, some of them by illustrating here. This is um, a fetal ultrasound uh, of a menstrual age, it's 19 weeks. And um, this is a classical keyhole sign. And uh, kidneys are echogenic and there is anhydramnios. Um, so this is a classical um, picture where the POV has been picked up well within 20 weeks and the kidneys are already echogenic and there is no uh, amniotic fluid. So here, probably most of us will agree that this has got a very grave prognosis and these parents are in the right window less than 24 weeks for termination. So they opted for a termination and obviously we saw this kind of multicystic kind of kidney with a severe dysplasia. Now, late antenatal diagnosis. Here we have a 24 plus week um, an antenatal scan. Um, the hydrouretronephrosis is found on the left multicystic dysplastic kidney on the right, and the thickened bladder wall with the trabeculations, dilated posterior urethra, uh, typical again keyhole picture, but the child is well beyond 24 weeks, which is a, um, the legal age for termination. And so this baby was delivered at a 33 weeks by emergency LSCS in view of severe oligohydramnios, intubated due to poor respiratory effort at birth, and received a surfactant. Uh, the chest X-ray revealed the crowding of ribs, typical respiratory distress syndrome, pulmonary hypoplasia, and the baby also had severe other electrolyte abnormalities. You can see that how bad the lungs were before surfactant, and uh, thankfully after the surfactant, things improved. So we could not even shift the baby out of the ICU, so we put a contrast, and then we found that there was a evidence of posterior urethral valve with the reflux into the right kidney. Uh, the, the creatinine, initial creatinine was the 2.8, and it actually increased to 4.9, and then with the catheter, it slowly started coming down. Now, because the, only, uh, the right kidney was multicystic, and then the left kidney was the only functioning kidney, we did a left loop urethrostomy in this patient, and um, the patient improved and went home, uh, but later on readmitted with the hypocalcemic seizures, metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, hyperlactemia, um, then uh, with, with, with all these problems, the baby was admitted twice. Uh, however, the baby tired over all the crisis and eventually the baby is now uh, one and a half years old. Um, but still there are a lot of problems here, like how to, um, you know, uh, how to decide on when to do the, um, the further management. I mean, that this child is obviously in the CKD, is going to end up in ESRD. Am I brave enough to close the urethrostomy? And um, there are babies on multiple medications, babies on erythropoietin. The valve is cleared, but the urethrostomy is still not closed due to the single kidney status. So when to close the urethrostomy, when to assess the bladder function, the role of dialysis, preemptive transplant, and the social financial support for this family, there are multiple issues and there are more questions than answers available for this particular baby. Now, this is uh, another patient who had um, diagnosis, antenatal diagnosis of a posterior urethral valve at 26 weeks with the severe bilateral hydroelectronephrosis and oligohydramnios. Uh, 
what are the indications for fetal intervention? What are the success and risks? And how do you counsel them? And what do you offer them? Uh, I mean, in those with the severe oligohydramnias, a normal cardiotype and salvageable renal function, um, which is determined by the fetal urine sampling, well, we have to actually sample it three times. Uh, and uh, that itself is quite an invasive procedure. And the fetal urine has to be, you know, having less than 100 sodium, less than 90 chloride, and osmolality less than 200, and the beta 2 microbial. the values keep varying. Some people say it is 6, 6.5, and all. Um, so, fetal vesicoamniotic shunt has been in war for a quite a bit of time, and of late, uh, the fetal cystoscopy. Uh, so, there, are, there is a proposed staging system for fetal LUTO intervention, um, where, you know, stage one, normal amniotic fluid, normal renal echogenicity, and, uh, you know, there is no um, dysplasia, uh, biochemistry is favorable. These are where there's no intervention uh, actually is indicated. On the other hand, there is also the, the group where there is anhydramnios and hyperechogenic cystic kidneys and then very poor uh, you know, renal biochemistry. There also, there is no role for intervention. And then there are those in between where the oligohydramnios, where um, again, if, uh, if it is hyperechogenic, uh, renal dysplasia is present and the renal cortical cysts are present and favorable um, over three taps, then uh, no intervention. So there's a small group of patients who actually benefit uh, with favorable samples in, and then they are the ones for intervention. And the window is again, uh, like very short window. Uh, the, the Pluto trial outcomes uh, were available to provide a definitive evidence regarding the survival benefit of vesicular amniotic shunt. Uh, so it definitely improved the lung outcomes, um, uh, but there are other uh, meta-analysis where statistically significant survival benefits there. Uh, but 28 to 60% had shunt displacement. 33% of them required dialysis or had renal transplantation. And the VAS complication rates were as high as 45%. And an overall survival after intervention also remains poor at 47%. So it, it does improve the overall survival and lung uh, maturity, but the renal outcomes now, the long-term um, need for dialysis is not altered. That is the summary of a amniotic shunt. Fetal cystoscopy improved perinatal survival compared to a amniotic shunt. Uh, there's actually 20, 20 times uh, more odds of um, improving survival. 10% of them developed a urethral fistula, and 5% of them had a recurrence of this obstruction. Um, and overcoming the angulation of the bladder neck remained a technically challenging problem. Um, then one of the comments in uh, fetal intervention was, paradoxically, fetal intervention may add to the burden of morbidity and renal failure by permitting survival of some infants who might otherwise have succumbed to the lethal pulmonary hyperplasia. So the fetal uh, lung interventions improve the survival, but not necessarily the renal outcomes. Um, so again, this is another flow chart about you know how to go about based on the amniotic fluid index and favorable prognostic markers. Uh, I am not going into the details of the entire flow chart, but uh, uh, in centers where the fetal therapy is being done, um, this is a classical like you know 20 weeks to 28 weeks, and then they they go for the they all the tests are done by 24 weeks, and then they decide what to do, and then between 24 and 34 weeks is where they aim for the improvement uh, with the help of the fetal intervention. Um, a stable posterior valve in, uh, in a preterm baby. Uh, this is a you know, antenatally diagnosed bilateral hydronephrosis delivered at 36 weeks. Uh, birth weight is three kilos. Um, the question is, is it amenable for primary valve fulgration? We have a multitude of instruments. These days we have this 4.5. Um, cystoscope with the bug B electrode, probably this is the best thing. The, the nine points of resectoscope may not go. Um, so that is the thing. And then this is the Mohan's valve at home. Uh, primary valve abl ablation is feasible and preferable in the vast majority. It enables bladder cycling and growth. And I prefer a cold knife over the diathermy. Um, now, I don't do routine check cystoscopy, but I get a repeat of VCUG at two to three months post ablation. And if the resolution is good, I do not repeat a scopy. There is a persistent posterior dilatation more than twice the diameter of the anterior urethra, 
or if the bladder counter is still abnormal and the reflux is still high grade, um, then I go for a scopy. All patients stay on continuous antibiotic prophylaxis and there is no routine bladder medication. So we have published this, our results are like early outcome following diathermy fulgration. And we, we found that cold knife ablation is superior to diathermy in relieving the uh, posterior urethral valve with a less fracture rate. And we also showed that uh, the posterior urethra diameter is um, um, more than 2.5 times 10 centimeters, the diameter of the anterior urethra, you need a pit cystoscopy. But in those, there is a resolution you can avoid a cystoscopy. Now, newborn baby complicated by urinoma is a unique condition. So this is a baby who was scientifically diagnosed with urinoma, and then at birth, when we did a posterior urethral valve, I mean, the guiding sister urethrogram, we found that uh, clear-cut uh, urinoma there. So the baby presented with urinary ascites, and the baby was catheterized, and um, also a PCN was done. And then later on, we went for a, a valve fulgration, um, and um, this patient uh, actually improved very well with the valve fulgration and focal nephrostomy. But there are situations where even with the valve fulgration, the baby does not get better. In such a situation, you may have to do a urethrostomy on the side where there is a um, urinoma. Long-term issues, valve bladder, the term valve bladder covers all dysfunctional bladders in patients with the posterior urethral valve. And the term valve bladder syndrome was first used by Mitchell describing the pathophysiology where the underlying obstruction initiates a cyclical event. And they typically present in an older child with a wetting, persistent hydrourotronephrosis and post-word residual volume, raising creatinine. So they need a Euroflow warding sister urethrogram and a urodynamic study. So the main aim of the Euroflow study or a warding sister urethrogram is to exclude a stricture uh, and uh, also you can find out whether the, the bladder is already decompensated. Um, then urodynamics, you can see whether it is high pressure bladder or an atonic bladder. So the, the differentiation is important, the treatment and also exclusion of a persistent valve is an important thing. Syndrome of nocturnal over distension of bladder called snob um, is another uh, term used for this kind of a uh, valve bladder where they benefit a lot from nighttime drainage clean intermittent uh, catheterization. Um, urethral CAC can be difficult in some of these patients. So a mitrofenov can be done, which can be an appendicular mitrofenov or a ureteric mitrofenov uh, like this can be done. Uh, so as I said, valve bladder uh, goes through a progression. Um, so we have to first exclude the stricture and then try anticholinergic medications and alpha blockers if there is a high residual volume and the timed void, double void, then CAC and night drainage, and that is the way to uh, take care of the uh, vicious cycle of valve bladder. So these patients progress from initial bladder instability to bladder compli poor com bad compliance, then uh, poor bladder emptying leading to myogenic failure later. Uh, so urodynamics and mitrofenov is needed at some stage. Uh, we have uh, studied uh, Mirabegron, the um, alpha-2 agonist, in patients and there was a significant reduction in the frequency and wetting episodes and improvement in, uh, in P dead max as well as hydronephrosis grade. So in a patient with valve bladder, we go like this and if there is a large post void residual volume, we go for alpha blockers. If there is a detrusor over activity, we either go for anticholinergics or if they are intolerant, we go for beta agonist, the mirror background. If it is an underactive uh, detrusor with the poor voiding pressures, we go for CAC and item drainage. So this is a 10-year-old boy seen in a patient with the dribbling of urine and urinary tract infections. Um, he had a history of urgency and frequency and a past history of posterior urethral valve diagnosed at birth. He had a bilateral urethrostomy in the newborn period and PUE fulgration at six months and a closure of urethrostomy at 15 months. He presented at the age of 12 with urgency, dribbling, uh, and then urodynamics revealed pressure up to 35 cc. Ultrasound revealed bilateral hydronephrosis, and the right kidney had only 10% function uh, or less with a very poor drainage. He was initially started on oxybutynin and the clean intermittent catheterization. He was also on nighttime drainage. Um, but still, his renal function deteriorated. And then, um, so we went for a lap nephrectomy 
and used the pelvis and ureters to augment the bladder. So that is one way of taking care of the, um, the valve bladder. If you have a dilated system and a non-functioning kidney on the refluxing side, this is called a typical VORD where a ureterosisterplasty is a useful option. Uh, this is a 16-year-old boy who presented with acute retention of urine uh, and uh, he had a posterior urethral valve or cystoscopy. He has already gone into decompensated bladder. So large capacity, typically watch with abdominal straining. So what are the options here prior to transplantation? I mean, this patient needs to have a CAC only. Nothing else can be done at this stage. And when they already present with the CKD, we need to do a pre-transplant workup uh, to with either a uh, urodynamics, sometimes they need augmentation and the off before they go for transplantation. So when we looked at the posterior urethral valve spectrum over the last uh, 19 years, we found that uh, 286 patients uh, were there and then uh, 227 were primary diagnosis. And if you look at the age distribution, this is interesting. Although newborn patients, newborn diagnosis is still there, a lot of them are being diagnosed at the one to 12 month of age group. So we still you know, are, are not picking up a lot of them in the newborn period. And still many of them are being diagnosed late. So among the newborn pay, uh, diagnosis, all of them had a ultrasound and MCU, and then eight of them had a diversion. And two of them died within 24 hours to severe pulmonary hyperplasia. But a huge majority, 47 out of 57, underwent a primary valve fulguration, and they are doing extremely well, actually. Uh, and among the infants uh, who are diagnosed, all of them treated with primary fulguration, and they all do very well at follow-up. Um, and um, they may need a second attempt of uh, fulguration in another 20%. Um, now, in the those presenting with uh, one to 10-year-old, um, if there are the two patients present with the urinary tract infection, but majority of them presented with a poor uroflow, dribbling, straining, and uh, they had all this lower urinary tract symptoms, and one of them presented with the CKD. And then another 10, 17 patients presented with voiding dysfunction, like dribbling, poor flow, and five of them presented with the chronic renal failure, with the vomiting, abdominal pain. So this is really sad uh, that, you know, they're still present like this. So I will wind up here and then come to the take-home points. The urinary tract infection in children should be evaluated fully as urosepsis is still a common presentation and um, they, we still get uh, most, uh, most, of the, most of the posterior valve well diagnosed during infancy, not the neonatal period. Bilateral hydronephrosis in a male fetus obviously alerts one to posterior urethral valve. Antenatal counseling is a challenge. We have to weigh the risks and benefits and uh, the fetal therapy is still a work in progress. It improves the lung um, uh, uh, outcomes, it improves the survival, but not necessarily the bladder outcomes. Primary filtration is highly effective, and the older children with the poor flow, staccata flow or retention, um, we have to watch out because still there are a lot of children who are late diagnosed with posterior urethral valve, and it is sad to diagnose a posterior urethral valve after um, uh, they say in, end up in chronic renal failure. So that's about it. Thank you very much for uh, listening to this talk. And I am now ready to share any questions.